I'd like to acknowledge the OCLC Research Library Partnership, which both underwrites and inspires our work, and much of the work you'll be hearing about today. Attendees of this webinar are from the OC Research Library Partnership, and I want to thank you for your continued support and your input into our work. These are both critical to our success. Um, I am going to turn things over to Roy Tennant at this point, who will kick things off for us. Take it away, Roy. Thanks, Marilee. Uh, welcome and thank you all for joining us or for listening to the recording afterwards. Uh, with me today are my colleagues, Shayla Weber, Rebecca Bryant, and Constant Malpas. They will summarize three areas of their current or planned research and advocacy work. And although Marilee mentioned this, people are still joining us. So I will say that we will take questions after the, all the presentations, but please feel free to enter them into the chat box at any time. And we will be sure to, to get to them at the end of their presentations. So with that, I'm going to hand it off to my colleague, Rebecca Bryant, to get us kicked off. You're handing it off to Taylor. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I could have sworn Rebecca was first. My bad. <laughs> Taylor. Thanks, Roy. Um, let's see here. Hi, everyone. I'm I'm Chayla Scott Weber. I am a newly minted senior program officer with the OCLC Research Library Partnership, um, and I will be talking to you today about some work I did with the RLP last year, um, uh, and specifically the 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 result of that work, which was a, a position paper titled The uh, Research and Learning Agenda for Archives, Special and Distinctive Collections in Research Libraries. Um, this, uh, the agenda was um, really kind of uh, um, a look uh, at it was in many ways it was a follow up to the work done in 2009 um, when OCLC research undertook a, a detailed survey of over 275 archives and special collections in research and academic libraries and the, the resulting paper by Jackie Dooley called Taking Our Pulse that kind of helped to shape the work OCLC research and the RLP did around archives and special collections for, for many years to come. And so the, the agenda was kind of a follow up to that. Um, we wanted to pause and reflect on what held true from that, it still held true from that work, what issues had kind of largely been addressed, and what new challenges and opportunities had emerged. Again, to help us uh, think about where we should be placing time and effort of uh, OCLC research with regard to archives and special and distinctive collections in the future. Um, and the process was a, a little bit of a departure from the way that uh, the group had usually worked. Um, we really wanted to situate the, the agenda as being a, a community look um, and uh, at the kind of current state of play. And we recognize that some of the areas identified in the agenda are well suited for OCLC to work on and, and others um, and there are other areas where, stakeholder, where other stakeholders would be kind of the strongest to lead on certain issues. Um, so with this, this community-wide intention, the agenda was created uh, via a, a really iterative and participatory process. Um, I assembled an, an advisory board of um, heads of special collections and assistant university librarians um, who I met with regularly throughout the process and also had discussions with uh, kind of focused conversations with colleagues across all levels of, of experience and areas of expertise to try to get both kind of high level and on the ground feedback about the current state of uh, play. And then we conducted um, two workshops uh, to get feedback on early stage drafts at the Rare Book and Manuscript Conference at ALA and later at the Society of American Archivist Conference, and then had a month long uh, open, um, open community comment period where we posted a draft of the agenda on Google Docs and, and got a lot of really valuable feedback from the community. Um, so today I'm going to um, give you a little bit of an overview. In the interest of time, it will be kind of a high-level overview um, of the agenda. 
And uh, so the agenda is organized into seven topical areas of investigation with suggestions for learning or inquiry activities under each area. The first area of investigation is the convergence of special collections in the research libraries. Um, through my conversations and exploration, um, saw that there's really an increasingly we're recognizing a convergence of the goals and services and skill sets and collections across both general and special collections. Um, there's a growing emphasis on supporting and teaching and learning, and that's impacting service in both areas. The evolving scholarly record means that general collections are adding things that look much more like special collections, including things like data sets, gray and ephemeral literature, and all areas of the library are grappling with providing discovery and access to these increasingly diverse array of collections. Um, the agenda identifies areas where special collections professionals can collaborate with colleagues throughout the library, uh, as well as identifying strengths within archives and special collections that can be valuable across the library. Uh, areas like appraisal, donor relations, inquiry-based instruction, and digital preservation. Um, the challenge here can be that, in, that special collections traditionally have had somewhat siloed identities and organizational structures, and so future work really needs to push past that, focus on aligning goals for archival units with that of larger library and parent institutions. And so activities in this area focus on pushing forward that realignment, both programmatically and structurally. Uh, the next area of investigation centers around advocating for archives and special collections. Uh, in many ways, it's closely tied to the first area of investigation, which really is about kind of reconceptualizing the value of archives and special collections in the research library. And this area is about the need to better advocate for that value. Um, you know, we heard that while there's been a lot of talk about the value of special collections and distinguishing the research library, that that hasn't always translated consistently to resource allocation for special collections. There's st still a heavy reliance on soft monies um, in special collections that, that in some ways can mask programmatic need. And there's a, a new generation of leadership coming in, and we've really heard a, a desire across, um, across the profession to kind of be able to better advocate for special collections. So activities in this area address skills and advocacy, building data sets to back up that advocacy, and understanding the true landscape of resource allocation to special collections. The next area of uh, investigation is um, thinking about next steps for Born Digital, and this certainly builds on the work that uh, the Research Library Partnership has done over the last several years. Um, you know, we're re we've really seen a shift in that time um, in Born Digital programs. They've grown exponentially in the last decade, and the needs in this area reflect growth from kind of pilot to program phases. Um, in, Bo in Born Digital. Much of the early work focused on capture of data from physical media and the work necessarily necessary at the earliest stages of stewarding digital collections to ensure authenticity and preservation. And next steps really need to address kind of the full array of activities that come after capture. And similarly, many nascent um, programs focused on advocating for a digital archivist position. And the agenda really identifies a need for moving beyond creating a single position to building distributed models of responsibility for born digital programs, as well as finding cohorts across the research library where complementary work is happening. And so activities in this area address both programmatic and structural challenges facing born digital uh, programs. Uh, the next area of investigation is uh, centers around addressing audiovisual collections. Um, we, I heard in our conversations that the AV holdings continue to be a top concern in archival repositories, both because of evolving modes of scholarship 
in which these are increasingly valuable and sought after sources for scholarships, or excuse me, for scholars, and because of the preservation concerns that many AV formats have, um, that, they, that these formats are near or at end of life. Um, the volume of AV holdings in uh, archives and special collections is, is really staggering and exceeds the ability to do preservation reformatting in many institutions. And additionally, there are further challenges from legacy practice of uh, legacy collections management practices. It means that many collections are not well enough managed or understood to make informed decisions about their care. So um, activities in this area concentrate kind of across that range of collections management um, and use and concentrate on appraisal, how to integrate AV collections into mainstream collection management workflows. Um, and so that we can better allocate resources for preservation and then understand research access needs for the collections as well. Um, the next area of investigation is, uh, is the evolving systems environments that we're seeing in archives and special collections. And while certainly this is, um, this is something that's happening across the research library, it's, it's being felt in kind of a unique way in special collections where um, you're seeing uh, exciting work for uh, kind of the first time in the last few years uh, with systems ad addressed specifically to archival and special collections needs, but also a, a, a steep learning curve um, because of that fast growth. Uh, you know, we're seeing a proliferation of systems that are collection management, digital asset management, often multiple discovery layers, request and circulation management, and then the whole suite of tools needed for working with born digital collections. And so the need is not only to manage multiple systems, but to manage our data that flows in and out and through these systems. And we're asking our data to support an increasing array of functionality and asking our staff to be increasingly data fluent. Um, Activities in this area focus on data literacy, data collection strategies for reporting and assessment, systems integration and interaction, and participation in and sustainability of open source software communities. Um, closely tied to this is, um, is uh, the next area of investigation about stewardship responsibilities and collection management. Um, Backlogs were uh, identified in 2009 and taking our pulse as a top of mind uh, concern and they, and they continue to be a concern in many repositories even though there has been really some wonderful work in the profession uh, to address backlogs. Um, but we continue to see backlogs of un- and under-described and inaccessible collections. Um, and backlogs are not just an issue because they impede access, but because they also impede our ability to make responsible and programmatic decisions about collection management, collection development, and uh, resource allocations more broadly, and impede efforts to advocate uh, effectively for special collections. Activities in this area outline a variety of strategies to continue to chip away at backlogs, um, activities around appraisal, building modern and extensible processing programs, reconceptualizing accessioning, and generally looking more closely at backlogs to better understand the nature of the problem in order to better address it. Um, and the, the last, but certainly not least, uh, area of investigation revolves around the challenges of diversifying our collections. Um, there is a growing and significant interest in issues of equity, diversity, and inclusion in research libraries, and it, and it manifests itself at every, um, you know, really every thing that we do in archives and special collections. Um, one of the ways that it, it manifests is in an, an interest in ensuring that our collections broadly and equitably document human experience and empower a wide public to see themselves as part of the historical record. Um, this has been driven by changes in cultural and historical scholarship, along with a growing awareness of the really the many negative social and scholarly impacts on our ace, of our asymmetrical historical record. There's also an increasing recognition that documentation is being produced and collected outside of traditional institutions, which is resulting in a desire to share 
to collaborate with community archives groups working to preserve their own histories as one of the ways to address representative holes in our collections. Um, activities in this area recognize that in order to respectfully and responsibly work with marginalized communities and those who've been working to document their own histories, that research libraries really need to examine and reconsider institutional, institutional and interpersonal relationships and consider power dynamics um, and identify methods of working that acknowledge and mitigate power imbalances and, and perhaps move away from a framework of stewardship to one of partnership um, and willingness to explore collaborative and consortial approaches to collection building. So those are, that's a, a brief overview of the major areas of investigation in the agenda. Um, and as I mentioned before, the agenda in some ways is really a first step um, to help us think about what, what we do next. Uh, so next we'll be looking for um, broader involvement and input um, the for one thing for this audience the uh, the agenda was very US centric in its development and so uh, I want to hear from um, RLP members internationally uh, to see how much the agenda does or does not reflect uh, the the challenges and opportunities you all are seeing I want to also highlight forward-thinking work in the areas of investigation through things like webinars and other ways to share work with each other. Um, we'll be working to identify what areas um, of the agenda the CLC and the RLP will, will take, uh, you know, take action in. And then, as I mentioned earlier, we really we know that some of these areas of investigation will be best led by others. So we'll be trying to be a catalyst to encourage action from in collaboration with uh, allied organizations and individuals. So I encourage you to read the full paper um, and I also encourage you to contact me um, if you have questions, if you have thoughts, if you would like to discuss your, uh, your context um, or work that you're doing um, around, the, uh, around these issues. So thanks so much and I will um, pass the baton to Rebecca. Hi, thanks Taylor. Um, so we're going to move into a different area of investigation here for us uh, at OCLC with the Research Library Partnership and that's the area of research information management. Uh, and I'm going to be talking with you today about three um, research reports um, that are released or have been uh, or are in progress at, at this point related to research information management. But I also want to tie them back to work, uh, which I think is really foundational work that has come out of uh, OCLC in the recent years on the evolving scholarly record um, as well as the stewardship of the evolving scholarly record. I think that the work we're doing here in, in RAM and as well as with Chela's work uh, and with so much that we do, research data management really is um, built upon um, and it's dependent upon our understanding of how the scholarly record is changing. So within research information management, I'm going to be talking about three main outputs. Uh, that is really an arc of investigation in this, this area this year. The first is a position report that was developed with members of an uh, RLP working group, including three members from Australian institutions. Uh, and that's really a position paper uh, about the role of uh, research information management, uh, the role of the library in research information management and trying to come up with a, a definition and models to help us have a more unified and international understanding of that. I'm going to talk a little bit more about that. We also in uh, December um, published a report uh, called Convenience and Compliance, which I will mention briefly. Uh, and I'll also be talking about uh, an in-progress uh, work, um, which is a survey of research information management practices. We've conducted the survey, and I'll give you a couple sneak peeks of, at some of the data that's coming out of that. And we'll be publishing um, both the data set and the report later this year. 
So let me go first uh, and remind you again that you can access uh, this report and everything else that we're working at um, through the link at oc.lc backslash RIM. Um, the goal of this working group's output uh, was uh, was really twofold. It was it was for us to to understand what libraries are doing and to talk about that and to frame that and to provide some talking points for libraries in this space. But it was also for us to provide uh, a framework for understanding um, very different practices um, because what we're seeing in North America may look and does look quite different from what we see in Europe and Australia or in Japan. Uh, and we wanted to, um, it was really useful to work with um, uh, representatives from the partnership um, on three continents in order to understand both the differences and also the similarities. So I want to talk um, first about our, our definition, which is that research information management is the aggregation, curation, and utilization of metadata about research activities. Uh, and we're calling it you know, research information management and mean for that to be an umbrella term, even though your local practices and terminology uh, may be different. I, I often jokingly call this often sort of an alphabet soup landscape. Um, you know, in the U.S., we, we almost never use the term CRIS where that is widely used in Europe, in the UK, I think also in Australia. We're seeing lots of different variations um, and often sort of different practices. We often call these profile systems here in the United States. But what we're trying to say is that if you, you know, think about the information that's being collected, if you think about the metadata, at some level, we're collecting information about research and about the activities that are taking place at our institutions and that our researchers and faculty members or instructors are producing. And those are the things that make this research information management. So we emphasize that this includes some or, or is potentially all of the types of metadata categories we've described here, which includes the traditional research outputs, publications, patent information, um, and is increasingly growing to include and to map to the grants and projects and equipment used, as well as statements of impact, et cetera, et cetera, um, as well as you know, that instructor's or that faculty member's instructional history, service awards, and the media around that. But the other model we think is necessary for understanding this landscape is to understand that once you have this bucket of metadata about the research activities of your institution, you may be using it in one or more of these ways. And we, I tend to think of an institution practicing research information management if it is doing one or more of these things. And very often an institution may start with just one area. Um, and I worked for an institution in the US, a large public institution, where we started with public profiles. But like many institutions, see the utility of that information and increasingly sort of grow to include other areas. Uh, and this can include repositories um, there in the upper left, um, links to full text for uh, publications, uh, for data sets. Um, so it's in, that metadata as well as linkages to the full text in some way. Um, it may include supporting uh, annual academic progress reviews. It may include the public or maybe campus-only directory or profile information about instructors and graduate students. Uh, and it, it may also include uh, elements needed for um, compliance reporting, external research assessment, or perhaps is driven more by the need for internal reporting uh, for managing awards and grants. And regardless of the case, once you have that information, uh, reusing the information um, can help uh, not only improve processes for your institution, but also for the researchers themselves. And that, that's often uh, where hopefully some of the, the, the convenience of, of convenience and compliance can come in. So one of the things that you can see when you read the report uh, is that Latrobe University was one of our working group members and is an RLP member. Uh, um, and um, we've worked with 
probe to uh, develop um, this, this model sort of specifically for the, the uses they're using right now. And so you can see that um, Latrobe uh, keeps a registry of their research information and then also ties that together with um, uh, their research data management tools, uh, online repository, their annual academic progress review workflows uh, and workload planning. Use it, of course, for external and internal reporting. Um, have public profiles to uh, support uh, discovery uh, and reputation management for the institution. And then, of course, to reuse that um, on other faculty pages um, or through the APIs, et cetera. I would invite you to also think about how this might apply for your own institution as well. And so that brings me also to the survey of research information practices. This has been a joint initiative between OCLC Research and the Research Library Partnership uh, and Eurochris. Uh, and our goal has been to really conduct the first of its kind um, data collection about research information management and to do so globally, uh, and also specifically to take a look at the role of libraries in this space. Um, we are in the process of analyzing our data, uh, and I expect this report later this year. So I have a couple slides just to introduce you to a little bit about what we collected here. We had 381 survey responses from 44 countries. Uh, and you can see um, how this breaks down here. Um, a great number, of course, from the UK, the United States, um, 24 from Australia, um, 10 from the Netherlands. The numbers go down. Um, sometimes it means that we have a sample that can be really useful, and sometimes the sample can be small enough that, it, that we can't necessarily draw large conclusions. Um, but um, we've had, I, I was actually overall really quite pleased with the responses. And I, I actually sort of mentioned that as, as one of the um, inherent limitations is that while it's a large uh, sample, it's still, it can be fairly heterogeneous uh, and some of our subsamples um, are maybe too small for us to report on, on separately. Although I want to indicate to you that we will be also publishing the data set. So if you wanted to dig into that yourself, um, you will be able to look at those, those results as well. Uh, we also found one of the challenges of writing the survey and that we know is, is just one of the inherent limitations is um, what I mentioned earlier, is that we often call these things different, different things. The language um, that we chose to use may not speak to every audience, um, uh, and um, that, may be, that may be inevitable. Uh, we hope that we learn things from this. We consider this a first effort. We know that that's a limitation. Um, despite that, we believe this provides um, the widest insight that yet on the degree of uh, research information management practices. Uh, and does reveal to us a breadth of REM practice worldwide. Um, we, asked, we, we wanted to talk with institutions and hear from institutions that were all different states of implementation. But 58% of the institutions um, reported having live or in production research information management systems. Uh, and you can see on the right that the breakdown we have, you know, of 193 um, sort of specifically answering the question about what system they're using, you can sort of see the breakdown there with um, Elsevier's pure product being 30%, but 28%, fairly close to that, also are using some sort of in-house or um, locally developed system. And then um, one, I think one last slide from the survey is, is also that we've asked a lot of questions about what the drivers are, what's the role of libraries, um, what identifiers are you using, et cetera. Um, we asked a lot about the importance of reasons for pursuing research information management. We're really interested in, in why institutions are doing this and why this looks differently in, in some places. 
And for those of you attending from Australia, you may be nodding your head saying, yeah, supporting institution compliance, yes, that's very strong because all 21 uh, in Australian institutions that answered that question indicated that, that that supporting institutional compliance is extremely important reason for them to engage in RIM activity. Uh, and it's certainly stronger than the 53% across uh, all 222 respondents who answered that. So I think that's sort of one of many of the interesting findings from this. Um, we're also digging into this right now um, and our finding and can document what we talked about with the position paper and what we knew anecdotally, but now we can see through the survey data as well, that libraries are playing a larger role in research information management as it intersects with library areas like open access and publications, metadata, metadata management, validation and workflows, as well as the training and support for researchers. Um, we also have findings that are largely congruent with um, the other report I mentioned and which was published in December, which is convenience and compliance, case studies on persistent identifiers in European research information management. This is a study of um, three European contexts, Finland, Germany, and the Netherlands, uh, and is a qualitative study about uh, REM adoption and specifically about the use of person and organizational identifiers. What we found in that study and what we're also seeing in the survey data is that ORCID is, is becoming a de facto standard in scholarly literature and for scholarly research workflows. Uh, but so far we're seeing little adoption of organiza organizational identifiers. So we're seeing similar results from both our qualitative and quantitative research here. I have more data that I didn't have time to go into today, preliminary findings. Uh, these are actually available on the web page I've pointed you to. You can take a look at these. These are from a presentation I gave last month in Europe. Uh, and do stay tuned for the report, which will be coming later this year. References are here uh, for you to look at later. And from there, I turn it over to my collaborator uh, and friend, Constance Malpas. Thank you very much, Rebecca. And, uh, and thank you to, to all of our attendees. Um, I want to echo everyone's uh, thanks and welcome to all of you to, uh, for joining us from uh, many different points around the globe uh, this, this morning or afternoon, your time. Um, I'm very pleased to have a brief opportunity uh, today to provide an overview of a research project that we are just wrapping up. Uh, this is a project looking at uh, impacts of change in the higher education space on the organization of academic libraries. Uh, this is a piece of work that began about 12 months ago uh, as a collaboration between OCLC Research and Ithaca SNR, an organization that I think uh, some of you will be aware of. Ithaca SNR has produced over several years uh, a series of influential reports uh, and uh, surveys on faculty and university presidents' perceptions of academic libraries. Uh, we came together with some uh, grant funding from the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation to examine this question of how growing differentiation, that is differences in institutional direction in the U.S. higher education system are likely to impact the future of academic libraries. An important piece of background coming into this work was a growing understanding that in the academic library community, we are seeing an ongoing shift from a traditional focus on collection-centric models of service and excellence toward models that are more focused on engagement with the distinctive needs of the parent institution, college, university, research institution. These are typically 
um, engagements focused on supporting the teacher teaching, learning, and research a mission and workflows of the parent institution. Um, much of the information about this project is available uh, publicly on the OCLC uh, research website. We are in the course of wrapping up our final report uh, now, and we expect the report to be published later this summer, um, ideally, uh, we think, in uh, July. Uh, possibly in August. So I'll be very briefly providing an overview of about a year's worth of research. Now, I mentioned that this work is focused on the U.S. higher education system, and given that uh, many of you in the audience are working uh, outside of North America, I want to um, it, uh, make sure to account for why it is that we chose to emphasize um, uh, the U.S. higher education in this particular uh, piece of work. Uh, that has partly to do with the, the, the sheer scale and scope of the U.S. higher education environment. Um, U.S. higher education um, is, is typically described as including a, a, something more than about 4,200 um, institutions, colleges, and universities in, uh, in the U.S., a very heterogeneous system, so we get a really broad view of the educational offerings. Um, also very important in our piece of work, we were uh, committed to providing a data-driven model of change in the higher education sector, which meant that we needed a, a robust uh, and comprehensive statistical source of reporting. Uh, many higher education systems globally have such systems. Uh, the U.S. has uh, one that, that is, is uh, fairly comprehensive for the 4,000 institutions, um, so very important to the methodological underpinnings of our work. Uh, further, in the U.S. higher education um, environment, we have seen over the last couple of decades rapid and accelerating transformation of the higher education sector, driven by a number of factors. I would call out just um, a few here. A uh, very important one in the United States is uh, pretty dramatic reductions in state level, that is public funding of colleges and universities. Uh, this uh, means that there's a shifting of the cost of service. Uh, there's a much greater emphasis on tuition revenues. That necessarily has brought about a great deal more attention to the return on investment for higher education, a much greater price sensitivity around higher education. Uh, additionally, uh, there are very important uh, long-term uh, historical demographic changes that are fundamentally transforming the enrollment pipeline for higher education. Uh, I've termed this growth of new traditional, uh, which is a term of art used in the higher education policy sector to describe the growing share of college and university enrollees who are part-time students, who are uh, students above the age that traditionally would have been enrolling in a college or uni uh, university immediately after secondary education. So these typically uh, would be students who enro are enrolling above age 24, often who are uh, in, uh, enrolled in a part-time program, enrolled in online uh, educational offering. So fundamental changes in the nature of the enrollment pro profile are uh, shifting the model of higher education. And of course, uh, all of us, I'm sure, are aware of the fundamental changes in the digital environment that are transforming um, everything in research, teaching, and learning, uh, certainly in terms of the systems on which colleges and universities rely, but also in terms of the way our uh, students and researchers approach uh, the very practice of, of teaching and learning. So uh, those are just a few uh, of the key factors transforming higher education in the U.S. and, of course, elsewhere. Uh, one of the important reasons to build this on a robust model based on a big data set for the U.S. is that having developed the model, it can then uh, potentially be extended to other geographies and educational data sets. Um, I haven't time to, to address um, how some of these larger trends are impacting higher education institutions outside of the United States. We could have a whole separate um, session on that, but simply to, um, to draw your attention in a gestural sense um, to some of the growing attention in the research literature, in the policy literature, in the general higher education press, to how some of these changes, digital transformation affecting the Australian higher education sector, um, the, the growing attention to 
uh, research performance in, in uh, the university sector across East Asia of fundamental demographic transformations and market transformations in higher education in Japan and other uh, segments of East Asia. So the trends that we're focused on in the United States are equally impacting uh, uh, higher education in other geographies. Our research was motivated by uh, a couple of key questions um, noted here briefly. Uh, the first is uh, the question of whether or not we could successfully move beyond the Carnegie classification. I think some of you will be familiar with Carnegie. This is a, a classification system that is widely used um, in the United States, has been really the dominant classification of higher education since the mid-1970s, um, which typically um, looks at institution types based purely, uh, primarily, on the highest degree that's awarded by the institution. So we talk about baccalaureate institutions, we talk about master's universities, we talk about doctoral universities. Our interest was really in going beyond that basic Carnegie classification to think about how uh, factors changing institutional um, investments, uh, attention, and uh, capital investments in, in different areas of university activity, and also changes in enrollment profile could be used to develop a new kind of typology of higher education institutions. That work has been uh, built on a comprehensive literature review and a statistical uh, typology that we've developed and indexed. Both of those are already available on uh, the website for this project that has already been shared in chat. A second uh, driving question behind this research was uh, whether or not a consensus view is emerging around what an academic library should look like in different institutional types. And there our methodology has relied um, on uh, both a survey, a broad-based uh, survey, which I will touch on briefly, and a series of focus groups that OCLC research has been running over the past year. I will touch on a couple of findings from each uh, component of our methodology. First, regarding the institution typology, which was a piece of work that OCLC research took on in this collaborative we used um, as our sample frame about 1,500 uh, colleges and universities in the United States. We focused on four-year institutions, so these would be institutions granting uh, the baccalaureate degree in the U.S. up through doctoral universities. Um, for those of you who are familiar with U.S. statistical reporting systems, important to recognize that the unit of analysis we used uh, is something called an IPEDS unit ID, which means that our characterization of a unit tracks with the way the statistical reporting is built. Our uh, typology uh, involved a statistical analysis of uh, variables in the national data set that enabled us to explore what colleges and universities do, that is the educational activities, how those activities track against three primary areas, research, liberal education, career directed education, I'll say a little bit more about that in a moment. And uh, secondly, the, the critical issue of enrollment uh, of enrollment pipeline. So how, how are colleges and universities uh, developing their educational offerings and for whom? And this is where we look at the degree to which an institution uh, has more of a, 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 a traditional character of residential learning for students under age 24 uh, and by the same token the degree to which the institution is shifting to support um, deeper engagement with the new traditional uh, pipeline that is uh, growing dominant in the U.S. and elsewhere. Uh, as I said, uh, uh, the literature that underpins our typology, the uh, data model behind our typology and the scoring formula and indeed the data set are, are all already published on our project website. Turning briefly uh, to our, the use of our model to investigate university uh, directions, uh, as I mentioned, we look at university educational activity along three primary axes, that is doctoral research, uh, 
activities associated with, with research and scholarship um, leading to the doctoral degree. Uh, the second uh, uh, poll that we look at is educational activity focused on uh, liberal education that is interdisciplinary baccalaureate education primarily in the arts and sciences. And the third uh, uh, poll of our model of educational activity is career-directed education. And here we're looking at uh, educational offerings in a college or university that are uh, explicitly directed toward uh, professional outcomes. So these would be baccalaureate degrees in accounting, a baccalaureate degree in, in science or forensics, uh, master's degrees that have a, 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 a very uh, clear professional orientation, and also very importantly, uh, non-degree certificate programs. So we have statistical uh, variables that underpin our scoring along each of these directions, and we score every member of our population of 1,500 institutions along these three directions. And as noted here, what we generally find is any four-year institution is going to be pulled in uh, two or more of these directions to varying degrees. Uh, an important test of our model, given that we were uh, interested to determine whether or not we can detect important differences in institutional direction, was to see whether or not we could identify clusters of related directionality within our population of 1,500. Um, and the good news is uh, that we were able to do that with our data set, and you see examples of that in this slide here. Uh, so on the left you see um, a radar gram that these are statistical measures for 60 institutions in uh, an organization that represents the most research intensive universities in the U.S. higher education system and you can see there's strong conformance to type right there's a strong shared directionality for those institutions that is very much uh, research directed toward the top and liberal education directed because of the ongoing investment in undergraduate education in those research universities. Uh, you can see that manifested in the directionality around liberal education. And as you look at these other uh, two radar charts, you can see uh, different patterns emerging for the Oberlin group. So this is a, a set of of elite liberal arts colleges in the United States who would claim to be the best at delivering liberal education. We can see they have a very distinctive and common pattern. Uh, similarly, if you move to the upper right, you can see if we look at the institutions with the highest directionality in career-directed education, they clearly are pulling in a common direction. So there are two important tests here I'd claim. One is that we can clearly detect important differences in, in, in the direction of educational activity. The other important finding here is that we've, we are able to detect diversity within those populations. So we can detect the strength of institutional direction um, against a particular cohort or type within the overall population. We applied our uh, model to our population as a whole. You see the scoring here. Uh, note that research is quite modest for the population as a whole, which leads us to an important question about whether or not the prevailing presumption, which is quite strong in the United States and um, arguably in other geographies as well, that research libraries set the model of excellence for academic libraries of all kinds. We would claim that uh, our analysis of directions clearly suggests that the institutional needs of research libraries and the institutions they serve are very different, substantially different from other parts of the higher education sector. Um, I know we have very little time here, so I'm just rapidly going to touch on some of our findings from surveys and focus groups as they relate to library uh, directions. We surveyed our population. Um, to determine what library directors perceive their institutional directions to be. This is a survey of ARL library directors, so libraries uh, that are that should be highly research intensive. And what you can see here is a relatively flat model of institutional effort, surprisingly not 
as research dominant as our data-driven model would suggest. Beyond asking uh, respondents to, to depict the institutional direction for their parent college or university, we asked them to score the uh, directionality of library investments, and this is what ARL, Research Intensive uh, Library Directors, told us. They believe their libraries are highly congruent with the interests of their uh, parent institution. Hard to say whether or not this is uh, well-justified confidence or if it's a kind of complacency um, in uh, a presumption that the library is delivering on what is needed. Um, in our focus groups, we have uh, surveyed, excuse me, uh, we have uh, had in-depth uh, multi-hour conversations with library directors around library service directions uh, related to these three educational activities. The short version here is that we heard ample evidence of growing consensus around excellence in library provision and support of research and in support of liberal education. Worryingly, however, we found very little consensus on what constitutes uh, successful library vision, provision around career-directed education. That is extremely worrisome given the dominance of career-directed education in much of the population, including the research library population. Uh, our survey investigated uh, library investments across key uh, service areas, nine key service areas. I haven't time to, uh, to dwell on those results, simply to, to call out the fact that three categories um, uh, providing uh, information access, enabling academic success, and library provision of study space eat up 60% of the current library budget in most of the research libraries. Um, uh, leaving very little uh, for other activities. Um, uh, the other uh, key finding for research libraries in our uh, cohort is that in an optimal world, if, if budget allocations were optimally allocated across these key service areas, there would be a significant reduction in investments around information access, and in fact, uh, support for student success would exceed, uh, would equal if not exceed uh, library support for information access. Uh, to summarize the changes for library directionality in research institutions, what we heard quite clearly is that there's a need for additional library investment in what Lorcan Dempsey has turned uh, inside out library activities. Those are library activities that are focused on surfacing the research outputs of the institution that are uh, deeply invested in engagement with emerging workflows that are engaged with uh, supporting institutional and uh, scholarly reputation management. And by the same token, there's a necessary, need, uh, a necessary uh, goal of reducing costs in traditional outside-in operations, uh, most notably around collections access. Um, just to, to close very briefly so that we have at least a few moments for, um, for live questions, I did want to to uh, remind everyone that the Research Library Partnership exists to enable research libraries uh, to connect to their future through uh, better alignment with the institutional priorities of the research institutions they serve. We, uh, I, I think, has been amply um, uh, shown in the presentations uh, this afternoon. We have programs that align with some of these primary areas of interest to research universities, the research information management agenda, which uh, Rebecca uh, discussed at some length, the research data management uh, agenda that OCLC has been moving forward, shared print, clearly uh, critical to the desire to reduce costs and management of collections. The Research Library Partnership is also a venue for uh, for staff development, for professional development, for our partner institutions to shape and lead the kind of community change that's needed to uh, bring research libraries in closer alignment with the needs of their parent institutions through participation in working groups and um, uh, support of some of the case study research that Rebecca and uh, Shayla also uh, discussed earlier today. I will. Uh, leave it there and uh, turn it over. I think, Marilee, I don't know if we have uh, time for any facilitation around questions. Yeah, Constance, um, <clears throat> we did have a couple questions, so let's just jump jump in right away. Uh, Stephen Hearn asked, and I believe this is for Rebecca, few institutions managing research data sets are promising to keep everything forever. Are there efforts to engage broader communities beyond the local institution in determining what to do with data sets that the institution no longer wants to hold? 
Stephen, uh, this is Rebecca, but I, but I also think your response is appropriately driven from Sheila's uh, comments about you know connecting with other um, stakeholders throughout the the library and Scott Lake community. Um, Constance and I have recently published, and I put in the chat, uh, about the realities of research data management. Um, but also, you know, Chela's talking about, you know, the, the, the expertise coming from archives and the need to hold things. I, I think that these are both audiences that, uh, and stakeholder communities and libraries that need to be involved. Uh, and I think that this may be an opportunity <laughs> for us to have further conversations across the community. Um, and, and I think I'll also add, and Constance or Chile, you may want to add, I, I think that, you know, you mentioned that, that institutions may not want to keep the data, you know, but another problem is that they may not have the data in the first place, uh, is that many researchers may be, um, you know, publishing their data at, in Dryad or with a publisher or with a, another repository. So um, I definitely, uh, agree that, that there's lots of opportunity for us to engage in, in sort of coordinated collection efforts here. Yeah, uh, this is Chayla, and I'll just jump in to say that I think this is one of the areas that um, where we, we see that convergence um, uh, between special collections and, and the broader research library um, and and uh, particularly in, in archives, you know, for years we've been <laughs> doing what we refer to as appraisal in archives, which is really kind of about managing loss, um, deciding what we can and should manage uh, and, and, and commit to the stewardship of and, and how we do that within our institutions and how we do that across institutions to try to, you know, make responsible choices. So I, um, there was a good uh, report um, that I'll put in the chat window shortly uh, from Jackie Dooley about thinking about some of these, uh, called the archival advantage, about thinking about some of these skills that archivists have that could be leveraged elsewhere. Um, so uh, yeah, good question, thank you. I think we have time for one other question, which also comes from Stephen Hearn which is probably for Constance, did the study of library priorities regard preparation for a scholarly career as, quote, career preparation? Uh, thank you for that question, Stephen. Uh, the, the short answer there is uh, no. Anything that is related to, um, to a career in, in, uh, in the academy would have been scored toward, uh, toward research. So we see that clearly as a career line. Um, but activities around, say, management of the scholarly reputation, uh, understanding, uh, you know, management of the scholarly communication process uh, would have been associated with the research dimension of the map. Uh, career for us really had to be something that was uh, a direct uh, workforce ready kind of uh, preparation program that would include some master's programs in STEM for sure, uh, but not doctoral programs. So they would be, uh, say, a data science program, which is clearly research related, but often people who get a master's in data science are walking out the door uh, into a corporate setting to do uh, analytics as opposed to uh, doing fundamental research on, on methodologies of, of data analysis. Well, <clears throat> well virtually at the top of the hour, I think we probably have to wrap up to make sure we end on time. Marilee, did you have some final comments? Um, uh, just, to, just really to thank you all for joining us today. We really appreciate your attendance and uh, your attention during the presentations today. I want to thank my colleagues uh, from OCLC Research for the really good presentations that they uh, gave. I think that Constance um, underscored very well the, the type of value that we seek to offer from the partnership, but we also derive quite a bit from your participation um, and from your engagement. So we really uh, thrive when we get uh, feedback and input from you, so we uh, see this as an opportunity to give you that opportunity um, for some feedback, so we hope to hear from you uh, following this webinar. 
Um, as we mentioned up at the top, this uh, presentation has been recorded. Um, within the week, I will be sharing uh, links to the recording and also to the slides today. Uh, we, uh, I think that there was a lot of uh, links that were shared in the chat, and we'll be sure to round those up and get those off to you again. So thank you all uh, once again for your participation, and this concludes today's webinar.